ladies and gentlemen, I have, I have enormous pleasure to uh, welcome uh, um, to this conference and introduce to you a very special guest uh, of us, uh, Minister of Defense of uh, Germany, Madame Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, the way I would like to shape our discussion is uh, the following. I would like to have conversation between the leading politicians of our nation about the alliance, but also about the policies of our nations, uh, um, about the values we stand for, um, and what we are going to do to defend the system of, uh, of values um, which, are, which is behind the alliance. Uh, and do we care also about those who are outside of the alliance? Uh, my first question, however, would be introduced by a very short historical remark. That's the tricky thing that in European history, years ending with nine, uh, contributed in the last uh, century uh, in a very um, special way uh, to the history of humanity in Europe. Uh, 1990, the Versal Treaty, the first attempt to create liberal war order and give the right for self-determination to many European nations. This attempt failed ten, 20 years later. Uh, the war uh, came to uh, the Central Europe. Um, we lost our state. Then, in 1949, only 10 years after, uh, NATO was created to defend those who remained free and independent after the Second World War. Uh, then, in 1989, again, um, uh, the Iron Card Cartoon uh, fell down, and uh, President of the United States, uh, George Bush, delivered a famous speech in Mars on the 59th anniversary of NATO alliance, promising that we may have Europe whole and at peace. And that's the vision that we should uh, move forward. Uh, only 10 years later, uh, three Central European countries joined the alliance. We enlarged our uh, uh, community. Then other nations also followed. Now, in 2019, we celebrate all these historical events that took place in the years ending at nine. So my question to you, Jacek, first, is uh, taking this under consideration, all these stories, all this history behind, how we could assess the health of the Alliance after 70 years of uh, its creation, also including the military and political challenges that we are currently facing, where we are as an Alliance? Thank you, thank you, Director, for this um, key to the subject question. I think that, first of all, 70 years, it is a long time, and for alliances, it is not often that they last so long. I think that one of reason is institutionalization, which is um, something new in comparison to historical alliances. So. Uh, people working in uh, Brussels, in Mons, in shape. So all it shows that it is difficult to dissolve the organization in the times of crisis. Was there a crisis? I think that in 90s, beginning of 2000, maybe yes, because alliances are created in order to face challenge from outside. And if there was no enemy, it was maybe difficult to maintain the alliance. And at that time, in my opinion, 
um, Alliance played a role more of the um, common security organization uh, being used outside Europe. But all of the sudden, 10 years ago, around 10 years ago, new enemy reappeared. It helped Alliance to unite again, to modernize, and the decision taken in Newport, particularly in Warsaw and in Brussels, uh, to strengthen the Alliance, to address challenges coming from this enemy, which is, by the way, very old enemy, uh, uh, existing at the beginning of the creation, helped to um, maintain health, robustness of the alliance. So my assessment of NATO is positive. Uh, it is uh, perceived by member st states as a relevant organization, useful organization. Moreover, for Poles, necessary to maintain peace and stability in this part of the year. So my answer is yes. Shape is good. But, but there are a lot of criticism. Uh, um, uh, over this issue, that uh, NATO, some allies are, are not, are, you know, contributing enough uh, uh, to our common home. Uh, you know, President of the United States is, you know, uh, is, let's say, uh, uh, we read the same uh, uh, papers, uh, sometimes very um, uh, critical about the contribution of, of the alliance to its health. So, as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, you have your positive uh, view, but do we really believe that all countries move in the same speed uh, fulfilling the commitment? I think that they move in the same direction. Maybe speed differ is different, and definitely Jens Stoltenberg expressed his opinion that Poland is a good example of that, so we understand that we have to invest, and when you compare investment in military domain in the United States and uh, in uh, European uh, Union or in allies, uh, European allies, there is a difference. But um, how, why is, is it so? I think that the threat perception in this part of the world, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, is different than in Germany and France. It is in my opinion, difficult to maybe mobilize political class or society to spend more on defense. There is still a tendency to continue with this peace dividend which emerged in the nineties. So the discussion is going on. I think it is, it is, it is very, not easy to change perception. Uh, um, the more time is needed to also introduce public opinion, to, uh, to uh, impose or to um, convince public opinion in European Union uh, member states that, that, that it is necessary to invest more. But um, Russia helps us, it provides arguments uh, that, that, uh, that peace is not granted forever. Madam Minister, the same question to you. I mean, how you uh, um, assess the health of the alliance in the age of 70? Well, um, if we hadn't NATO today, we would have to invent it. This is my perception of NATO. It is more necessary than ever as an alliance fighting for the same values. That's what you pointed already out. And uh, thank you for the brief description of uh, the history of the last 70 years. Um, NATO has always been the vanguard of our common values, and I think we should name them again, at least a set of them, democracy. I mean, your country has been fighting for democracy so hard and so long, just this, this value of democracy. Freedom, you know what freedom means in a completely different tone. Uh, the dignity of every single human being. And uh, the, one of the most important values we are fighting for is the rule of law. We have a set of international laws of a good, out of a good reason, because we come out of two horrible world wars, and then we were aware of the fact that we need a set of international laws everybody has to abide to. Um, second point, yes, you are right, 
Um, there was a time, mainly after when the, the uh, Iron Curtain came down, we thought somebody called it the end of history because the two antagonists, capitalism and communism, weren't there anymore. We thought something happens like uh, what we call the peace dividend can be paid off more and more and more. And we all know here in this room, this led to a development of 25 years of budget cuts. And you are right too, that it was the year 2014 when the crisis hit, Russia's annexation of Crimea, the violation of international law, um, then the hybrid war in the Ukraine, which goes on till today, but also three months later, ISIL showing up Mosul, 10 kilometers from Baghdad, putting in flame Syria and Iraq. So the threat of terror was there too. And I would like to ask a third component which will accompany us uh, for forever, uh, more and more dominant, and this is the cyber component. We will certainly talk about it a bit later, but this, this affects all topics we're talking about when it comes down to, to, um, to threat perception. And um, this, this change in security environment in 2014 and the years to come uh, did also change the threat perception in our countries. And uh, when you were referring to uh, contribution and sh burden sharing, first of all, the Americans were right and they are right um, to ask us to do more. Um, I remember uh, the, the summit in Wales. I was, since a few months, defense minister when we set uh, the commitment to aim to move towards 2%. And yes, the speed is different and congratulations on your investment in your defense budget. But I want, if you, I may <laughs> also add, uh, apart from the investment in the national defense, a crucial point is also capabilities and contributions. So Germany is the second largest troop contributor to NATO right after the United States. I know we have to do more what investment is concerned, but this picture shows that all of us have understood after this serious crisis that we have to move forward and to change things. And today, as I said, if we hadn't NATO, we should have to invent it. We would invent it because if I look at our eastern border, and we haven't forgotten what, how the feeling is we were for 40 years eastern border, and thanks to the alliance, thanks to NATO, we were safe and could grow during that time. So we, I am completely aware what it means to be eastern border today, and therefore your worries and our worries, your security is our security, we are aware of that. This is the reason why we do have enhanced forward presence. Um, our British friends in Estonia, our Canadian friends in Latvia. I mean, this shows how strong the alliance is, what defending values is concerned, from Canada to Latvia. Germany is the framework nation in Lithuania, and the American friends are here in Poland. So I think these are strong signals that we are determined to keep up the centerpiece, this is Article 5 in NATO, but also to stand for the values we are defending together. Madam Minister, you said, and I like this phrase, that uh, didn't we have a uh, uh, NATO alliance now, we would have to create it. My question to you is, do you really believe that today we would be able to create NATO? That we would be able to uh, gain public support for launching such, such an alliance? What about your country? Yes, absolutely would we be able, because, I mean, what is at stake? It are, these are our democracies. I was talking about the violation of international law, which you and your, uh, our Baltic friends uh, have every single day. For example, uh, with fighter jets coming into the airspace of uh, the, the Baltic airspace, where we are air policing with our Eurofighters. But I'm also talking about the terror attacks we have suffered. So uh, challenging the way uh, of life we are leading an open society, open-minded society, a tolerant society. Um, so these are threats uh, the, the population is aware of. And 
To be honest, if you would have asked me 10 years uh, before, do you think democracy is threatened? I would say, oh, come on, no, this is a an, an, an success story. Nobody will stop ever. But we know better today. So I often think that um, as you have fought for the freedom and the democracy in your country, my parents have fought for it. So I think it's our generation now who has to make sure in a globalized world that the principles of democracies, the principles of unity of Western democracy, and Western is not geographically meant, but under the uh, topic of values, that our children one day will be living in these kinds of democracies with freedom and respect for the dignity of the human being and the rule of law. This is our task today, and uh, this is a serious task, and our people are aware of it. Uh, Jacek, uh, for us, for Poland, uh, the Warsaw Summit, uh, um, almost three years ago, it took place here, uh, was uh, a symbolic uh, um, shift um, for the alliance, but also for our, our, our understanding of, of the alliance, that we are, uh, this time, we are not going to ignore what is going on outside, and we are not going to ignore uh, the changes for um, European you know, security that were caused by Russia. In 2008, I think, the West tends to close their eyes on, after Russian aggression on Georgia. Uh, we turn back. We, you know, we pretend nothing had happened. We uh, launched you know, uh, um, reconciliation. Uh, the red button was shown to, uh, to the general public of, of the alliance. And a completely different notion, a completely different policy was uh, introduced, as if nothing happened. So my question to you, uh, are you happy uh, with uh, in, you know, uh, the process of implementation of, uh, of decisions of NATO that uh, took place uh, um, in Warsaw, the NATO summit in Warsaw 2016? Are you happy? Well, I think yes. Uh, my answer is simply yes. Uh, we should be satisfied with the implementation of these decisions. So they were taken, they were implemented. They were symbolic. It shows that uh, other countries demonstrate solidarity with, uh, with us and we also demonstrate solidarity with them by being, being uh, in Latvia and Romania as far as Polish soldiers are concerned, Germany and Lithuania. We host American soldiers and uh, Croatian, uh, uh, British, uh, Romanian. Um, okay, maybe, maybe the uh, military significance of these units is not very high, but as a deterrent factor, it, it, they play an important role. I think this is the way how we should cooperate. It also strengthens our cooperation, friendship, interoperability. So these decisions were very important. Of course, unfortunately, Russia hasn't stopped its aggressive behavior. Uh, Last year, the events or incidents in the, in the uh, Sea of Azov uh, is an example of that. Therefore, Poland asks for more, particularly from our perspective, American uh, soldiers uh, could, is, uh, are an uh, important uh, deterrent factor for Russia. Therefore, we would propose strengthened military presence or NATO presence in Poland. Currently, if I'm not mistaken, there are 37,000 of American troops stationing in Germany. Um, in Poland, 4,000. We ask for deployment of more for forces or, or on a long-term basis. It would, it would demonstrate, again, to the external world that there is an interest uh, uh, on the side of the U.S. to defend uh, um, European countries. As Ian Stoltenberg said uh, an hour ago, um, Americans increased their commitment to Europe also through 
um, sending more, more, more military personnel to that part. So this is a, an effective and it is a, a positive, so to say, element of that. So yes, my answer is positive. The problem is um, transatlantic unity and maybe minister probably will comment on that, some different perspectives in key EU member states uh, or NATO, European NATO member states and United States concerning deployment and further preparedness to, this, uh, to challenge these threats. But for the moment, decisions were implemented. They also demonstrate uh, the unity of the uh, Western uh, democratic society, which is important. For Poland, transatlantic links are crucial for our security. And it could be a danger if we interpret too far differences between the European allies and the United States. So the question, the same question to, to, to Madam Minister. Uh, do we believe that we have enough forces on, on NATO eastern flank? Um, I, I w would like to start, uh, you started with the Warsaw Summit here, which I have in best memory. You were a wonderful host at that time, phenomenal. Um, and yes, it we was... Are always wonderful host. Yes, yes. <laughs> but there too. Um, and at that time, um, I remember this was the summit, if I may call it, sort of adaptation. So uh, in 2014, it was the turnaround. Uh, the decision taken, but then we uh, took stock in 2016, adaptation was implemented, and yes, you're right, out of it came enhanced forward presence, I was just referring to it. We should not forget what has uh, grown since then, Bequ be, uh, because within the framework nation concept, um, we are working on the so-called larger formations, follow-up larger formations for enhanced forward presence, which is, we are working on the um, uh, VJTF, the rapid spearhead. Germany is leading the VJTF uh, in this year and in 2023 again. So all these are, sorry for being so technical to the audience, but all these are structures of adaptation and growing um, uh, potential that we have been building up and that we are building up without any question. Um, and on top, we should not forget, as I said, we, we have the 360 degree view on threats around us. Um, we formed the coalition against terror, fought ISIL, and today NATO is in Iraq too uh, for capacity building to strengthen this country to uh, be resilient against the ISIL terror, the Islamistic terror. So um, you see from my words, there is a hell of a lot of work we have done, but there's still a humongous amount of work we have to do. And the fuzzy target threats are sometimes show that we have to really be aware of 360 degree view. And this is um, because th therefore I want to put emphasis on, on one hand, uh, the, the Russian threat, we will have to deal with China sooner, sooner or later too, but also uh, the terror threat, the Islamistic terror um, threat, because this shows that wherever you are in the world as a democracy, and you were mentioning, I think, Spain, for example, completely different, but very much uh, busy with questions concerning Islamistic terror, for example, Wherever you are in the world, if you want to defend democracy, if you want to defend our common values, the threat may, might be changing. It might also be a massive cyber attack on your infrastructure, uh, a massive propaganda and disinformation campaign in social media. So we have, to be, we have to be agile and adaptive in many different fields with the one goal we always have, defend our values and our democracies. Uh, we in the Institute, we are uh, very familiar with uh, this uh, part of this uh, cyber threat. Uh, uh, our Institute is being, uh, has been attacked numbers of times uh, from the outside, um, and two times successful, unfortunately. Um, um, my question to, 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 to you would be, you know, taking as a, as a uh, uh, point of departure what has been already said, 
uh, the, the following. Uh, since 2016, since, since uh, uh, Warsaw Summit, uh, Russia enlarged uh, its military presence on, on its uh, western borders, interfered in uh, democratic processes in a number of, uh, of uh, NATO member country, members, uh, countries, um, um, escalated uh, um, against, against Ukraine, um, and, in, you know, uh, we also read in the press that even in uh, a referendum in Catalonia there was, uh, you know, Russian, visible Russian interference into it. So my question to you, whether, whether we are capable to really deter Russia, um, one may say, one may draw the conclusion out of all these facts that we are failing to provide uh, credible deterrence to that. What's really credible deterrence uh, um, that is effective against Russia? If I may put it in a frame, uh, what you're describing is something I would call the glass is half empty. But you can see it the other way around too. The glass is half full. Because what we do not know is what would have happened if we were not as successful as we are towards an opponent who is constantly provoking us. So uh, remember a few years ago, our Baltic friends, rightly so terrified uh, about not being protected. How much have we built up now to make clear if there's one square centimeter that is being attacked, we will all 30 allies stand at their side. So um, you can also see a, a story of success. Um, yes, there is a lot of interference in social media um, with disinformation and uh, trying to stir uproar uh, in the communities. But uh, we have also by, over time, developed resilience. We're talking about it because we are a free society. We are dismantling uh, the ways this fake uh, information and propaganda is being used. I, I could go in depth in uh, examples, but perhaps it takes too much time. But we by now see the patterns. So the people learned about trolls, about bots, about fake news, because we can show it to them. And what are we doing? We're giving the media competence um, to, to uh, understand, okay, this is not to be taken serious because this looks like a classical propaganda uh, information and uh, other sources are more relevant and more reliable. So I'm, I'm talking about this mixture that is offered to us as threats by, for example, Russia or Islamic State is taking exactly the same means in, in the cyber, cyberspace. And I would say the glass is half full, that we've been uh, managed to modernize, we have been managing to modernize, to adapt, to uh, face these threats, and to develop our strategies against it. One point is very important. Our opponents try to provoke or hurt us um, with their strongest means. We should be smart not to let them decide on what kind of field we are struggling together with what kind of means. If I may, for example, just put in the little spot that the Russian GDP is smaller than the GDP of Italy. So this is their weak side. And we should be smart in our responses and have a long breath and strategic patience to uh, deal with these provocations. We would like to live in peace. We would like to sit down at the negotiation table uh, and to solve our issues and problems. But uh, we, have to, we have to make clear that not our opponents determine the fields we're struggling on, but that we set the tone. Yes, but uh, let me go a, a little bit deeper into that. Are we smart enough? Uh, mix, mix, mixing, mixing uh, uh, a deterrence and engagement. I, I particularly mean uh, Nord Stream True, which uh, raised a huge controversy uh, on, on um, at, at least those, those countries which are neighboring to, uh, to Russia. 
the argument is on the uh, German government side that we need to bring Russia closer um, uh, to our transatlantic community, to uh, uh, Europe. Um, is it a contradiction of terms? I mean, uh, are we too much and try to engage Russia, not to deter them? Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, where we were outstanding, outstanding, and this is the glass is half full, is in defining sanctions together, I'd say as, as NATO, but also as Europeans, and to standing and living up to these sanctions. This is not an easy task because you have to bring together many, many different countries of many different interests. But we have managed because we saw that there is an overarching goal. This is defending our democracy. So the indiv individual interests have to step back a little bit. And um, these, these, and if there's, uh, if I may say so, uh, you, you remember our chancellor being tough on Russia, uh, with choosing the right sanctions and bringing together uh, all of us at a table that we stand up to these sanctions, for example. But whatever, um, whatever we're debating, uh, there is also the, the truth. We know that we always have to keep the door open to sit down at the negotiation table. This is, this is as, as mature democracies, a principle for us, that we want to solve our problems at the negotiation table. How do we do that? From a posi position of strength, of course, and that's what we are talking about, how we build up the strength of NATO, we build up the strength of the European Union towards Russia. Uh, we do not want these issues with Russia, but Russia is provoking uh, all the time or violating international law. But uh, it still is an experience of our history that in the very end, out of a position of strength, we need to come to the negotiation table and solve the problems there. Thank you. Jacek, uh, do it's, we it's, have a, a right mixture of, a right mix of the policies towards Russia? Just, how much uh, mm -hmm. deterrence we, may, we should have? How much engagement we, we should uh, uh, shape? I think it is important discussion concerning the issue or question if democracy are well prepared to face challenge from authoritarian states. And the discussion is going on also between uh, theoretical uh, uh, experts. They say what counts in international relations today is the power to extract resources from the society in order to use them in international relations. And Russia is a very good example. So some authors claim that authoritarian regimes are better prepared to face challenges, that they might win the competition. So the question is how democracies can defend themselves. And indeed it is a crucial question because when uh, uh, Russia exports gas through North, North Stream 1 or North Stream 2 in future, they use revenues not in order to improve democracy or the conditions of living of society, but to create a robust military instrument to pursue policy uh, which is against the, the, our values. You, uh, Minister, uh, said very important word. GDP of Italy is the, um, higher than Russia, but how it is that Russia's military might is much stronger than Italy? And this is the question. So Russia will use, uh, will, will interfere to the internal affairs of democratic countries in order to weaken them and to win that competition because they perceive that from that perspective. I'm optimistic in that, that the, the understanding of the situation is growing. So we have to, as democracies, create instruments to fight, to resist the cyber threats, to be united among democratic states. Transatlantic links are crucial. They should be first before the relations with Russia. And we should be united vis-a-vis uh, -vis such countries like Russia or maybe in future in China. Uh, yes, but what? I just yes, want to absolutely. say a word. Of course, I mean, transatlantic bonds are the, 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 the foundation um, of what I was just talking about, the values. Yeah. And um, I think what, what uh, characterizes us as free countries, for example, 
is the fact that within NATO, as sovereign, free, trustworthy allies, we're able to debate about issues. We have no problem to have differences in issues, knowing that we are united in values. And um, the, the one point I want to emphasize too is, if I may say so here in Warsaw, <laughs> uh, the Warsaw Pact did not collapse because of military intervention, but because of complete economic and political failure, which does not mean that you do not need military means. And sanctions you need, contributed you to need, that. Yes, you need very strong military means to make clear out of a position of strength, you are arguing. But I, I just want to invite us to have a look also at our economic and our political means. So you need the whole set is my message, the whole set of them. But, but yeah, I would like to also reshape a, a little bit my, my, my question. What do you think uh, um, um, about, you know, what's, uh, that, what does Russia did her best? What kind of mixture of our policies? Whether, you know, enhancing our military uh, capabilities uh, on, on, on our flank, investing in our defense, uh, showing resilience or engagement? No, uh, definitely uh, the first, but let, my main point in this discussion, when I think about the subject, I've been thinking for some time, is that conclusion would be that not only military means, or they are not the most important. The most important is general influence on economies of countries which we uh, create uh, threats to us. Therefore, you, we have to have a holistic approach to look how Nord Stream contributes to building up military uh, capability of Russia. Sanctions, yes, but maybe these sanctions should be more um, broader and more robust. Um, it, it is the problem. So you have to because it is um, you can change uh, economic might into the military one so you have to block the possibility to develop economically for those countries who might create a threat so that is my main point but of course uh, in practice you have to have um, uh, military forces to to deter and even uh, to defend uh, a country my my, my last yes. My last question would be about uh, 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 um, the recent situation in our, you know, our relations with Russia and also um, um, concerning our European security. Uh, uh, Minister Chaputovich uh, mentioned that Russia uses its, its uh, economic might uh, to uh, create robust uh, military power and a uh, violation of INF Treaty, which was fundamental for uh, security of Europe for years, uh, is one of the good examples of that. Um, uh, we know that, and all allies have been uh, aware that Russia has been violating INF Treaty for years. And we, for years, we are, we are unable to shape, to shape our right uh, um, effective policy, effective response to this violation. Now we, have, we are dealing with the situation that the United States taking, uh, takes the lead um, and um, are about to withdraw from INF Treaty at all. Um, uh, also introducing an argument that it is not only about uh, Russia but also about China, which is not bound by this treaty. How Europe should react on that, how our countries should adapt to, to this situation. So this question first uh, goes to uh, uh, Madam Minister. Yes, INF Treaty. Uh, the paradox in the situation is it's a treaty between Russia and the United States and it concerns European security. <laughs> and therefore, too, I must say I am proud of NATO that within the last weeks and three months, uh, we have formed a solid block at, uh, as answer. Um, we're speaking with one voice. It's a solid piece of music we're delivering. And uh, the point is, of course, 
at the moment being, we try to convince Russia to come back into compliance till August. If this would not happen, probability is not high, um, then I think, and we should use this time to look at a mix of measures we have um, that after the treaty presumably failed, uh, we can convince Russia that it is better uh, to sit down and to negotiate a new kind of de-armament treaty. And there comes China in the game. Because if you look at the range of medium-range missiles, yes, Russian medium-range missiles threaten Europe without any doubt. But if you look at the range from China, Chinese medium-range missiles, and they have a hell of a lot of them, threaten Russia, not Europe. And therefore, to open the picture and address China too, of course China has already said, we will not speak with you, but we are free to speak about the topic. <laughs> this is the, the positive part on free countries, that they can talk about what they think <laughs> is necessary to talk about. Then it might be of interest for Russia too to get into a frame where the Chinese topic is addressed too. Uh, Jacek, what's, what's your view? How we should respond to the uh, new situation in, in INF, with the INF Treaty? Yeah, so we already responded. So NATO uh, uh, countries supported uh, American decision to withdraw from the, the treaty. Uh, of course, the treaty was between two parties. If one party do, does not observe, there is no treaty, so it's obvious. The problem is with the perception, uh, because it was kind of a, a nuclear taboo, or you can say even weapons uh, taboo. So societies are not prepared to that situation. Uh, I fully agree that the best solution would be, and maybe we even might aim at a multilateral treaty concerning uh, these missiles to be reached an agreement with Russia, but also China, other countries, uh, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia. It would be good to, to have that. Maybe it is our future. There is one problem. How should we react? So the main question is, if there is no treaty, it means that the deployment of intermediate range uh, missiles is allowed. When you withdraw from the treaty, does it mean that you accept the deployment of this kind of missiles? And that is the question nobody wants to answer. Now there is a, a kind of a game to blame another side. And of course, I am for involving Russia and for demonstrating that they brought the, the treaty first. So when you, Minister, said that Warsaw Pact collapsed, um, under the pressure. So it was a pressure. It was a deployment of uh, Pershing missile, cruise missile, which ended up with the with with withdrawal from, from Soviet Union at that time to, uh, to, 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 to accept the treaty. So the question is, is it possible to force other uh, countries like Russia, China, to uh, sign the new treaty without first stepping up uh, uh, military involvement here. So this is the question. I think that we will live with that uh, problem for next years because it is not easy to deploy new kind of missiles. You have to invest in that. But it is a very, very serious problem. As Jens Stoltenberg said uh, an hour and a half ago, uh, it is also the problem for them and both. And German and Poland will have to face that. Just one uh, comment concerning your very um, vo uh, important voice. I fully agree. I have an observation um, as a foreign minister that defense ministers are more willing to acknowledge the importance of transatlantic links. I wish a defense minister are foreign ministers, but when I discuss with Heiko Mas, it's not so simple. Not always, but Thank you for confirmation, your uh, strong support for uh, uh, transatlantic things. We are going to host this discussion next month, I believe. Uh, 
Uh, my last question, and we, I, we have only five minutes, so uh, no long speeches um, um, are required. But uh, there's a, a lot of talks about strategy autonomy uh, of Europe. There is a, a lot of complaint about Europe's contribution to the transatlantic uh, security. Uh, my question, very, very simple, is uh, can Europe, European Union, uh, can be autonomously, autonomously, um, 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 you know, uh, straightforward to invest more in military capabilities that are of double use, both civilian and military. Uh, there is a um, um, huge underinvestment in this kind of the capabilities in uh, east part of Germany and also Poland. Can we use European Union to be more autonomous uh, in this regard? Can we use European Union funds to upgrade uh, the, uh, these uh, the, um, um, structures, this infrastructure required also for our um, uh, NATO uh, 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 capabilities to deter Russia? Because you know, the movement of forces is quite and, and the speed of movement is quite you know, crucial uh, for uh, the concept of deterrence. Can we use the European Union to do, this, do something? I think that it is uh, possible and even it, is, uh, it, it would be good just to create, it is an example of a synergy, something which is necessary from the point of view of uh, European Union and it, its defense and security, so to say, dimension, will work also for NATO. So it is, and it could be also counted as a kind of a contribution to, to NATO, to, to defense. Very good example. When we discuss about strengthening defense capacity of the European Union, so all we, Poland always say or oh, add to that, yes, we are for, but it could not go, be against transatlantic bond. And it is an example, infrastructure, which could be used for different kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, uh, military activities, uh, either uh, EU or NATO, but also for civ civilian purposes. So very good, very good. Uh, important question. Now I think that when we ma maintain structural funds at the high level, the structural funds contribute to the development of the infrastructure. Also the one which could be used for military purposes. So everything is connected. Madam Minister, how do you see it? Yes, um, I, I can only uh, support your words and add on. Uh, if you look at NATO, we have 30 members, uh, 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 allies in NATO, 22 of them are Europeans. And it's right that uh, the Europeans have been for a very long time very fragmented in their defense structure. So when we're building up now, for example, the European Defense Fund, it's a strong incentive to procure together which will bring more interoperability within the European Union members and, of course, add to the capabilities of NATO. And uh, as a defense minister with the German Armed Forces, I have no problem at all to, to understand that we have one single set of forces that has to be ready to deploy for NATO or a European mission or a United Nations mission. We, we are in all three of them. So um, I think for me, I'm completely convinced that this, this NATO will always be collective defense. The European Union has to get its act together. We are on our way with the European Defense Union to get organized and to get more efficient in these things we do. And it will strengthen NATO. This is one thing where I'm absolutely convinced. Um, uh, when you said at the very end, it, it comes all together. Um, Thinking of my own family, um, of course I'm German-European. It happened that uh, two of my children were born in the, United, in the United States, so they are American citizens. One of these two children, American citizen, proud mother, studied in Poland. So the story goes all around, you see, it, it is all the same family, it fits, it has the structures, if you might want, the transatlantic structure, the European structure. It has this, this sense of united in diversity. We're different, but we are united because we share the same values. And therefore, uh, thank you for your words. I can only underline them.
I think we uh, couldn't have dreamed to end this conversation on a better note. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to, all of you to join me in expressing our gratitude uh, and uh, thank you for, uh, um, to both ministers for their presence, for their contribution to this birthday party uh, of, of uh, NATO Alliance in Warsaw. Thank you very much for being with us. Applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.